Good evening, everybody. It's time to begin our Sunday evening worship service here at the Lexington Church of Christ. Um, I was not given any announcements except for one. Um, we're not having our zone meetings tonight, so everybody can just go on home whenever we get done. But uh, if I missed anything, feel free at this time to let me know. All right. In that case, we'll go ahead and get started with hymn number 478. <clears throat> 
Would you pray with me? Our kind, our our heavenly, merciful Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another beautiful day that you give us. We thank you for the family that meets at this place. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We ask you, Father, to help us to realize that we are all brothers and sisters and that we always love each other as we do know that you love us and know that we're all trying to get to the same place at the end of this life, that we might have a home with you someday in heaven. We ask you to continue to be with our loved ones that may be sick and are able to be with us, that you comfort them, that you heal them, that they'd be back with us soon. Continue to be with us in the service tonight. We pray that everything we do would be pleasing in your sight and to glorify your name. Continue to be with us each day that we live, that we'd always remember that we are children of yours and that we would act like it every day that we live, that we'd be a good example to others, be a guide and light in each day. Continue to go with us, guide us and direct us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The book of Romans addresses many of the greatest thoughts and concepts known to all humanity. Well, like what? Like the concepts of sin, grace, law, faith, gospel, righteousness, and justification, just to name a small handful. An accurate breakdown of the book of Romans would be this. We believe that this is a simple way to look at the book. In Romans chapters 1 through 3, the main idea there is the need of the gospel. In chapter 1, the Gentiles need the gospel. In chapter 2, the Jews need the gospel. In chapter 3, why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so all need the gospel. In chapters 4 through 8, we see the nature of the gospel and various aspects that are mandatory requirements of the gospel. In chapters 9 through 11, we learn about the nation of the gospel, and the nation of the gospel is the church of Christ, that is the Israel of God. And then in chapters 12 through 16 of Romans, we see some necessities in the gospel, really necessities for having proper conduct as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Thus, an accurate and concise summary statement of Romans is the righteousness of God. And the book of Romans teaches us about justification. Tonight, we want to have what we think is a pretty interesting sermon entitled, Ten Fundamentals of the Gospel. And we're going to look at Romans 1, verses 8 through 17. And each of these ten verses is going to be a point. So tonight's sermon has ten points. So we may be here till midnight. Probably not. We'll see. We'll get through this pretty quickly, we think. So fundamental number one is in Romans 1 and verse 8, and the idea there is persistence. This is a fundamental facet of the gospel. Notice the text of Romans 1 and verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. My God doesn't indicate that Paul had a different God than the saints at Rome, and please keep that in mind when he talks about my gospel in chapters 2 and verse 16. But my God indicates the closeness of the relationship between Paul and the Godhead. Notice the persistence that your faith, the church of Christ at Rome in the first century, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Wow. That is definitely among the various congregations of the Lord's people in the first century, which seems to indicate years of faithfulness and diligence. Wonder, is the faith of this congregation spoken of throughout the whole world? If not, why not? Well, it could be. I don't know if it is or if it isn't. But the idea there is in order for anything like that to happen, would we agree that it would take persistence? That we would have to keep the faith and keep on doing what we know to be right, not just for a little period of time, but years and years and years of persistence. We believe that is a fundamental of the gospel. The second fundamental of the gospel, moving right through the text, is that of prayer in Romans 1 and verse 9. Notice the text. For God is my witness. That's a form of an oath, but it really is a reassurance of the truthfulness and Paul's inspiration from the Holy Spirit. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, Paul said without ceasing. Does that mean that the only thing he ever did in life was pray? He just muttered prayers under his breath all day long, right? No. So that without ceasing means at regular intervals and at appropriate times, not necessarily every waking moment of the day. Prayers is a broad form express, giving this idea. It's all expressions of a person's heart to God the Father. You may want to note 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 and 2 to see that we're to pray really for all men, even for kings and for those who are in authority. But I've always found it interesting, look at the language there, especially at the end of the verse, that without ceasing, I make mention of you. That seems to indicate perhaps even each individual member of the Lord's church at Rome in the first century. Question. When is the last time that you as an individual approached the Father in prayer 
and prayed for every single member of this congregation by name. You know, the easiest way to do it for me is we're creatures of habit, right? Basically, everybody sits in the same place that they ever sat. And from my perspective here, I, I can tell you about who sits where. And when I do this, that's how I do it. Now, you could take the directory and you could start in the A's and you could work to the Z's. There may be a thousand different ways to do it. But it might be a good practice and remind ourselves that a fundamental aspect of the gospel is prayer. And Paul said, I make mention of you. Perhaps that even means on an individual, name-by-name -name basis, always in my prayers. A third fundamental of the gospel is patience from Romans 1 and verse 10. Notice the text of Romans 1 and verse 10. Making request, if by any means now at length, Perhaps the idea is at last, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Now, Paul became a member of the Lord's church in Acts 9. That would be about what we would consider A.D. 37. Romans was written around A.D. 58, so it appears that perhaps, I don't know exactly when the church at Rome was started, but perhaps there were some there on the day of Pentecost from Rome in Acts chapter 2. Don't know if that's... For sure, when the church at Rome began, but it could have been those people going back home at some point. But Paul had evidently desired to come to Rome for some period of time. Now, Romans was written around A.D. 58, so perhaps Paul had been waiting years, maybe even two decades, don't know for sure, but had been desirous to go see these saints at Rome. This request was granted about two or three years later, if you read in Acts 28 and verse 16, though Paul didn't exactly get there by the easiest of means, we might say, because he ended up spending two whole years under what we might consider house arrest in Rome in Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. How much patience do we have with our brethren? How much patience do we demonstrate in desiring to see them or communicate with them or any such like? This is a fundamental aspect of the gospel that perhaps... We need to be reminded of from time to time. The fourth fundamental of the gospel, moving right through the text, is proof in Romans 1 and verse 11. Here's, when you see four, F-O-R, in your mind say, here's why. Here's, here's the reason of verse 10. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Now the evidence in the New Testament is clear. The apostles of Christ were the only human beings who could impart miraculous gifts to others. You can see that from Acts 8, 14 to 19. Paul proved that he was a legitimate apostle of Christ in Acts 19, 1 to 7. And he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, that is, among the Lord's church at Corinth in the first century. So there's no doubt Paul was a legitimate apostle of Jesus Christ, able to impart miraculous gifts to others by, it would seem, the literal impartation of his hands. You might want to note 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. It appears that from the first century perspective, there were nine broad categories of spiritual gifts, of miraculous gifts that were available for a period of time in the first century. And ask yourself this, why, why would anybody listen to somebody like Paul? Because they could prove that they were God's men. How? They were inspired. They could work miracles. On one occasion in Acts 13, do you remember what Paul did to a man by the name of Bar-Jesus? Elamus the sorcerer, do you remember what he did there? He struck him with blindness for a season. So these men had proof that they were God's men. Now what does that have for you and me today? We know that the things written by Paul are not his uninspired opinions. This is the inspired, authoritative Word of God, and the gospel is built upon proof. The greatest proof of all, really, is that Jesus Christ came out of that tomb on the third day. How did that happen? But by means of a miracle. The fifth fundamental of the gospel is in verse 12 of Romans 1, and this is participation. Notice the text of Romans 1 and verse number 12. That is, that I may be comforted together with you, by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Do we see here that Paul received encouragement as he also encouraged others? 
We generally know that word as edification. I help build up you, you help build up me. How so? Because we participate in the gospel together. And this also brings, kind of like this morning's sermon to some extent, that concept of fellowship, that we're joint participants together with Christ, with the apostles in the gospel. That's something that's a very basic fundamental that we need to be reminded of from time to time. We're not in this by ourselves. If we're in Christ and faithful, we're in this together. Your faith encourages me. Hopefully my faith encourages you as our collective faith helps encourage others. A sixth fundamental of the gospel is in verse 13, and this is a fundamental teaching that perhaps we often overlook, and it's that word problems. This is a fundamental basic teaching of the gospel. If we think that once we become Christians that everything's going to be 72 and sunny and it's just going to be like driving along smooth paved road at 55 with the cruise control on, that's false. That is not how it is. Notice Romans 1 and verse 13. The text says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you but was let. Here's how we can see English has changed. If I say, my wife came over here and said, Brock, give me your wallet. Oh, okay. That's not a too absurd a request. Now, if I let her have my wallet, how do you understand that? That means I reached in my pocket and I handed it to her. And that's exactly what I did. Been trained very well, by the way. Now, if your Bible's like mine, what do you notice there with let? You have a translation mark, and the idea of let there is not permitted, but hindered. So English is a living language where Paul says, but was let hitherto in the King James. The idea is he was hindered. Not that he had, not that it was easy, but there was actually a hindrance there. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. That seems to indicate that perhaps the majority of those at the church at Rome in the first century were what? It appears they would have been basically Gentiles. Now even the apostles of Christ were hindered at times. Remember a passage we quoted this morning from 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. That's a form of problems. But then you may also want to note 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 18. Sometimes... Satan hindered them. The text just gives us the fact. It doesn't give us all the how that we might want to see. But the facts are given. What are the facts? Paul wanted to come to Rome, evidently, oftentimes, but something hindered him. What was it for sure? Don't know. But one thing we can know is that moving forward, looking at Paul's life, did he have problems? Yeah. In our lives as Christians, are we going to have problems? Yeah, that's a fundamental aspect of the gospel. A seventh fundamental of the gospel is in Romans 1 and verse 14. And the idea here is people. What do we see people to be? Do we view people as flesh to be manipulated, to bend to our will? Or do we see people as souls made in the image of God who are going to exist somewhere forever? either in heaven with the Godhead or in hell with the devil and his angels. Romans 1 and verse 14 says, I am debtor. Question. Do you feel a sense of debt to your brethren? Do you feel a sense of debt to the world? That we are bound under an obligation to help them to do something? Notice the remainder of the verse. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul felt bound by duty or obligation to do something, and we're going to see it's preach the gospel. The Greeks indicate the wise, the barbarians there parallel with the unwise. They both indicate all aspects of every society, everywhere, the rich, the poor, everywhere, above, below, between, around, however you want to look at, of all nations. Because the gospel is for all. How do we view people? Do we view them as flesh to be manipulated and bent to our own will? 
Or do we view them as souls made in the image of God that are going to exist somewhere forever? You know, perhaps if we would learn a very basic fundamental teaching of the gospel is that people are souls made in the image of God, would that change our view toward them just a little bit? To the fact that we need to do our very best to try and help people get to heaven and realize what really is important and what really is not? Paul said, I am debtor. Do we feel bound by duty or obligation to anyone for anything? It's a fundamental teaching of the gospel. Fundamental number eight is preaching from Romans 1 and verse 15. The text continues, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. To preach the gospel means to announce good news. It means to evangelize. That's the idea. What does it mean when someone talks about evangelism? We're talking about announcing the good news of Jesus Christ. God's word is designed to be read and understood. That's Ephesians 3, 3 to 5. The power to convict and convert is in the word of God, not in the messenger. The power is in the message, and the message is the gospel. The proper preparation or lack thereof can make the message easier or more difficult to understand. Go back and look at your leisure at Nehemiah 8 and verse 8. So they read in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense. That's the idea of preaching. We try to teach the fellas all the time. You can figure out how to have, if you feel like you have to say something, they can get up there and ramble on and ramble on and ramble on. But it's different when you have something to say. Do you, do you see? Having to say something is not preaching. When we preach, we have something to say. And that something is the gospel. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we ready? Are we ready? Because gospel preaching demands for the proclaimer to use great plainness of speech. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 12. Fundamental number 9. Say you won't be here till midnight. How long could it take to get through two more? Fundamental number 9 is the concept of pardon from Romans 1 and verse 16. Notice the text. 4. Here's the reason for verse 15. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Four gives us the reason. Paul says, I am not ashamed. Paul felt no humiliation or embarrassment for the gospel he preached. Today, people want us to feel ashamed for teaching what the Bible teaches because it often condemns their lifestyle. And we live in a day and time in society where if you condemn someone's lifestyle, you're wrong. Well, they want to make us feel ashamed for what the Bible teaches, but that's not the way the Bible reads, is it? Was Paul ashamed of the gospel? Indeed, he was not. Incidentally, it's impossible for those who are ashamed of the gospel to be ready to preach the gospel. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Paul said, I'm ready to preach the gospel. Do you know why? Because he was not ashamed of it. Notice he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not a gospel as in one of many, but the. The definite article is there. The gospel of Christ. Not the law of Moses. Not a gospel as in one of many, but the gospel of Christ. Why, Paul? For it, that is the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. Sometimes salvation can be used in a physical sense. Remember what Paul said in Acts 27 31? Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Well, what saved was under consideration there, but saved from drowning. So sometimes salvation can be used in a physical sense. Now, is the gospel of Christ God's power unto physical salvation? It's God's power unto spiritual salvation. That is the salvation of the soul, spiritual rescue from the condemnation of personal sin. Someone might say, my sins are too horrible to be forgiven. No sin today is too horrible to be forgiven. But all sin will be forgiven, not my way, not your way. All sin will be forgiven God's way. 
And God's way that he chooses to forgive sin now is revealed in the gospel. Not the law of Moses, not the 23rd chapter of our own minds, but in his gospel. Notice, who's this for? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That means there's personal, individual responsibility that we have to this gospel. And sometimes the word believe is used as a synecdoche that indicates to obey. So if we believe the gospel, will we obey what the gospel teaches us to do in order to be saved? Well, yes. John 3, 36, Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, Acts 4, 4. What do you mean to everyone that believeth? Paul says to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This really seems to be the point of the book. The gospel is for all because all need the gospel. Why do all need the gospel? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6, 23. Fundamental number 10 is perfection. Romans 1 and verse 17. Notice the text. For therein, wherein? The gospel of Christ. For therein is the righteousness, the right doing of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. This really was nothing new. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, the just shall live by faith. The gospel of Christ is perfect. What do you mean? It needs no additions. It needs no subtractions. It needs no modifications, though explanations are sometimes necessary. Remember Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch? The Ethiopian eunuch was reading from Isaiah. Understandest thou what thou readest? He said what? How can I? Except some man guide me. So sometimes we may have to offer a word of explanation, but the gospel needs no additions, it needs no subtractions, it needs no modifications, though we may have to give a word of explanation here and there. The just shall live by faith. A small little verse, we might say, from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. And that's a, we believe that Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 is a prophetic type. There's something, there was an immediate meaning in that time, but there was an ultimate fulfillment Obviously, in the gospel. So there, the Bible is always relevant. Sometimes people use that term, dual fulfillment prophecy. Don't use that. It's a prophetic type. That means it meant something in the prophet's day. There was perhaps, we may say, an immediate application, but an ultimate fulfillment in the New Testament, generally speaking, with Christ and the gospel. That small little verse of Habakkuk 2.4 is used in three different New Testament verses and really the emphasis is a little bit different each time. Here in Romans 1.17, it seems that the emphasis is the just. The just. It's used again in Galatians 3.11, and the idea there is the just shall live by faith. That seems to be the emphasis there. And then it's used a third time in Hebrews 10 and verse 38, for the just shall live by faith. Three different times. A small little, perhaps we might look at, insignificant verse that if we were... When's the last time you read the book of Habakkuk? Most people even call it Habakkuk. I don't even know if we pronounce it right, but it seems that it's Habakkuk. So when's the last time we really read the book of Habakkuk? How many verses have we totally overlooked that when we read in the New Testament, there's a tremendous amount of meaning in those same verses? Friends, this is just one small section of the book of Romans. Just one small little section. Ten verses, ten points, ten fundamentals of the gospel. Perhaps the entire book of Romans could be done the same exact way these verses have been done. The book of Romans also contains the pertinent information necessary to become a Christian and to behave as a Christian. Have you ever heard someone talk about the Romans road? You ever heard someone talk about that or the Roman road? To salvation, perhaps that has become more of a denominational mindset. But you know, we can go through the book of Romans and we can determine what we need to do to be saved. So then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So hear the gospel. Believe the gospel, Romans 1, 16. That's in the text. Repent of sin, that's Romans 2 and verse 4. Confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That is the confession made unto 
salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And the book of Romans teaches that that when we are, that, when we are baptized, immersed in water for the remission of sins, that's where we're buried with Christ in baptism. That's where we're planted together in the likeness of his death, in his burial, and his resurrection. Romans 6, 3 to 7 and then the book of Romans in its own way teaches Christian living. How? We need to die to the love and practice of sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There's the question. What's the answer? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Romans 6, 1 and 2. Romans 6, 11 through 13. Wherever you are, make it right. Do it now. As together we stand, as together we sing the song of encouragement. Please go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall never get sight of the gates of light in the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross. Sometimes I'm passionate. I love the church. I love everyone here. And that's just my nature. Sometimes I come across angry, but I'm not. And I love everybody. And I'm sorry for the way I come across at times. And 
for breaking them guidelines. So I'm going to ask Brock and y'all to pray along with him, please. Let's pray. Our kind, merciful, gracious, and loving Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name and how great thou art. Father, first and foremost, we repent of our sins. We confess them unto thee that this prayer will not be hindered unto thee, that it will come up to thy throne of grace and mercy as a sweet-smelling savor. Father, we recognize that thou art the God of all comfort, the God of pardon, the God of mercy. And Father, we beseech thee now on behalf of our brother John Harper, who has expressed his penitence. He has made adequate confession of his wrongdoing, and we believe that he is truly repentant of what he did. And Father, we know that if we confess our sins, thou art faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Father, we ask of thee at this time to take away John's sin as far away as the east is from the west. Cast it to the deepest depths of the bottoms of the ocean, never to be held against him again. We understand Hebrews 8.12. We understand that in the better covenant with better promises, thou desirest to be merciful to our unrighteousness and our sins and iniquities. Once they're covered by the blood of Christ, we'll be remembered no more. Father, help us as a congregation. It has been rather difficult, not just today, but in the really the last several months. It's been tough. There's been a lot of things that have happened. And Father, we are all trying to do our very best to be pleasing unto thee. And we all make mistakes. We all commit sin. We all do those things that in hindsight we truly regret. So, Father, look at us as a congregation as a whole and allow us to make the right decisions, to say the right things, not for the betterment of any one individual, but for what is best for the kingdom right here in Lexington, North Carolina. We love John, we love all the elders, we love the deacons, we love every saint here, Father, and help us all to work together. Help us to have the same mind, the same care one for another. May we all do our very best to be pleasing unto thee in all things and at all times. Forgive us, Father, and hear our prayer acceptably in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, for it's through him we pray. Amen. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege that you give us each and every day. And we thank you for the privilege that we have to be able to assemble, to worship you. Now, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread that symbolizes Christ's body that hang upon the cross. We ask you to bless each one that partaketh of it, that they'll remember the time that he died for our sins. For it's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Let us now give thanks for the cup. Our dear Heavenly Father, once again, we do give you the thanks and the praise for allowing us to be able to assemble to worship you. And dear Heavenly Father, we will always hopefully remember your son that died upon the cross. Because through his dying upon that cross, he shed his blood that we could be able to be with you someday in heaven if we do thy will. So let us remember these things as we partake of this. For it's in Jesus' name we do humbly pray. Amen. Let's now give thanks for the offering. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all things that we receive from you. We realize, dear Heavenly Father, that everything that we have is yours, and you just allow us to be able to be stewards of it. And we ask you, dear Heavenly Father, to, that we could be the best stewards of what you give to us. 
And dear Heavenly Father, we want to give back to you a portion of what you have so freely given to us, not grudgingly or necessity, but with all true love towards you. For it's in Jesus' name we do humbly pray. Amen. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us, dear Lord, even those that we may have taken for granted, dear Lord. Pray that you'd please be with us throughout this week, that we might reflect on things and might make choices that will help us in the long run, dear Lord. Pray that you'd please be with those that are sick and injured, that they will get better soon be restored to health, dear Lord. Please guide, guard, and direct us, and be with us, and if it be your will that we have another day to worship you and live for you. Please be with us while we depart from here until we come back again at the next appointed time, dear Lord. Pray that everything be in your will always. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.